Welcome to The Dirt on the Past, a program of the Extreme History Project that explores the good, the bad, and the ugly about our human past. Because, let's face it, Crystal. Yep, history is not pretty, but it is so important to know. Because it is the very thing that has led us to the most critical concerns that we have in the present. So join me, Nancy Mahoney. And me, Crystal Alegria. As we talk to archaeologists and historians who have been digging in the dirt. And in the archives. To uncover the fascinating histories that are not only relevant to today's issues. But help us move forward in a better way with a deeper understanding of our past. Hey, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of the show. I'm Nancy. And I'm Crystal. And we're the co-hosts of The Dirt on the Past. This week, I am in Boise, and Crystal is at the KGLT studio speaking with Dr. Danielle Mead Shever about her research on women who followed medieval mercenary armies. And we're excited to talk with Danielle. But first, Crystal, let's check in. How is your week? How is your week going? Well, it's going really good. And right now, starting today and going through tomorrow, is Give Big Gallatin Valley, which is a really big giving day here in Bozeman. And so we participate every year, and it's a great way for us to raise funds for operations for the Extreme History Project. And so we are doing a donor lounge. A donor lounge is basically a place where you can go and give donations for the organization. But we're doing our donor lounge tomorrow at Nancy's store, Mocha, in downtown, very historic downtown Bozeman. And we're going to be running walking tours all day long long tomorrow as part of Give Big. So we're super excited about that. Our tour guides yes, are. are really ready to go. And thank you so much, Nancy, for hosting the Extreme History Project at MOCA and and let us think, running, letting us run the walking tours out of MOCA. It's going to be a great day. Yeah, these mini walking tours, I think, are a brilliant idea. I think it's going to be so much fun for people to get a taste of what extreme history does yeah. and be able to sort of do it around some shopping and some giving at MOCA. So yes. we're really excited. And for those who come after noon, there'll be um, there'll be wine maybe uh, uh, we can have from our yeah. tap sort of um, to offer along with what small bites we have. So we're pretty excited and we're hoping for great weather there. Yes, so, yeah. yes. Cross it's fingers exciting. for good weather. Now, of course, by the time this podcast airs, this will have been already complete, but uh, we do... And it'll have been a success. It so will we'll be just call it a success. A, exactly. It was a great success. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but if you still want to donate to Extreme History Project, you can definitely do that. If you want to help support Extreme History, but also help support this podcast, just go to the Extreme History website and you'll find our donation page and throw a few bucks at us. We'd love that. We always love that. So yeah, <laughs> so that's yeah. what's going on. That's what's top of mind for me right now. But Nancy, what about you? What's going on with you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm excited about some of the the opportunities we have with the podcast and working maybe with the State Historic Preservation Office. So more on that to come. We're very excited about some opportunities there. But right now I am in Boise, Idaho, uh, picking my daughter up from college and we are driving back tonight so we can actually be there for the Give Big Donor Lounge tomorrow. But um, it's it's a thrill. And so I am the one on Zoom this week, not the guest. Um, yeah. But yeah, <laughs> we are, yeah, but we're excited to get going on this and we're excited to, to welcome Danielle. Yeah. So Danielle, we're so glad to have you with us here today. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Wonderful. Wonderful. And we always like to start off by telling our listeners a little bit about our guest. So, Danielle, we're going to introduce you to them. Danielle Mead Shelver is a history professor at the University of Maryland Global Campus, an institution founded to provide educational opportunities for the U.S. military. Dr. Shelver studies early modern history in Europe and America, and among her publications is a joint translation of a Norwegian study on immigrants in the U.S. Dakota War, and that was published with Melissa um, Gelstad. Gelstad, yes, I think that's right. Her current research focuses on the intersection of gender, language, and power in 16th century Europe. Dr. Shevor also serves as lead editor of The History of Applied Science and Technology, which is an open access digital textbook, the first of its kind, that is global in both approach and authorship. In addition, she serves on the executive committee of Scienti, Scienti, an international and interdisciplinary research group working at the nexus of the Renaissance, 
Early Modernity and the History and Philosophy of Science. Danielle Mead Shelver graduated from West High in Billings and received her PhD from the University of North Dakota. She currently lives in Montana with her husband, a retired Marine, and their children. Welcome, Danielle. We're so excited to Welcome, have you. Welcome, Danielle. Thanks. Yeah, and Danielle, you know, you and I met a while back because you did a lecture for the Extreme History Project, and it was an online lecture because it was during the time of COVID. And so um, if folks want to look back and look for that lecture, it's on our YouTube page. So I just wanted to say that before I forget and, and not mention it at the end of the podcast. But so we've known and, each and other. And I want to for... just interrupt and say yeah. that. I also met Danielle before this because she came into Mocha and she had bought a beautiful pair of free people pants, which she told me she wore for a presentation of her research. And then, of course, when I asked about it, I knew that we needed to have her on the podcast. So um, a very nice way that we all have our lives interconnected uh, in Bozeman. Yeah. So anyway, I'll yeah. turn it back to you. <laughs> <laughs> Which was great. But I want to start off, Danielle, by just asking, so what first brought you to the field of medieval European military history? Well, my family is all very interested in history. We were sort of steeped in it growing up. Both my mother and father were always very interested. And our trips always landed us at um, old places, whether um, a medicine wheel or burial mounds or castle ruins or old cemeteries or, or museums. We just, this was, history is always just a part of the fabric of, of my childhood and, and my life. And as far as um, uh, medieval European history goes, I mean, who doesn't love Vikings and castles and witches? Right. I mean, it's just... Right. <laughs> But military history is, um, it's really come a long way. It used to be a sort of great man history, meaning about um, individuals, this idea that an individual person is sort of responsible for the trajectory of history and, and, and for in individuals responsible for tra trajectories of history. But now um, military history is more about the boots on the ground, people like my husband and all the vets in my family and all the vets in Montana. Um, Regular folks and um, women and, and animals, actually. There's mm. really interesting new research on um, the care of horses, for example, and how that has changed over time. Uh, horses in the military and uh, dogs and you know, dogs of war in, yeah. in the medieval period. But anyway, yeah, yeah I just it's, it's always been part of my mind. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. it sounds like you grew up lo with a yeah. love for history. Yeah. Um, Danielle, you have done a lot of interesting research. Tonight, today, we want to start with um, one of your more recent presentations that you gave, um, in which you're you're turning it into a chapter in an edited volume, I believe. The paper was titled, Women on Campaign, Paul von Doinstein's Elsa von Venn as Exemplar. And I may have butchered that pronunciation. I'm sure I'll hear from my husband. Um, <laughs> how will we get... We'll now get a little bit later to Elsa, but first, um, can you set the stage for us in terms of time and place? So for our listeners, a sense of who we're talking about, who um, the the military campaigners were, where they operated during this late 15th and early 16th century period. So we're talking specifically about a, a kind of German soldier called the Landsknecht. And uh, the meaning of this term, pe people argue and fight about this a lot. Uh, these are um, soldiers who had a very specific uh, style of fighting, um, fighting in, in pike squares. And we'll talk more about that um, later, I think. Um, but they were founded, this 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 kind of soldier, the Landsknecht, was begun by the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian in the late 15th century because German soldiers were not very good at that time. And we, we tend to think of Germany as being very militar militaristic society historically and very disciplined historically, but that right. really, it's not really true until the age of the Prussians, so um, starting like in the 18th century, so the Prussians who came over to serve in our, in our American Revolution for Queen Charlotte. Um, but before that, so like 200, we're, we're, we're about 200 years before that. And okay. the German soldiers are not, 
they're just not any good. <laughs> and the Swiss are amazing, and they they command the highest pay. So all soldiers, virtually all soldiers, are mercenaries at this time, because there just isn't the infrastructure uh, to support standing armies, and so. Um, the Swiss are – they're very good. The Scots are also very good, but um, the Swiss are, are known as the best and the French are the only ones who can afford them. And the French and Maximilian are virtually always at war in Italy. Um, and so Maximilian's how, – how can I – how can I compete? So he he forms the Landsknechts and he does this by employing some Swiss to teach the Germans how to fight in this specific style. So – Okay. All right. That's really interesting. Um, it is really interesting. I, I never really think about um, the fact that there weren't standing armies at that time. And yeah, that this this whole who who really had the technology or at least sort of the organization to, to teach others. That's fascinating, Danielle. Yeah, yeah. So your research, Danielle, really focuses in on the female camp followers, kind of like you were talking about at the beginning, you know, kind of broadening this historical narrative a little bit to include women, and you really focused in on that. So, um, uh, but can you, but I'm going to come back to that, or Nancy's going to come back to that, but you really talk about these mercenary armies and how they were outstripped by trains of women that really followed them. And so what types of people were in these army trains, including the women, and what kind of activities did they perform as part of that camp train, those followers? So the army trains uh, were really like traveling cities. They were huge, hundreds and sometimes thousands of people. And they were um, everybody you'd find in, in, in a city. You'd, you'd have um, uh, cobblers. You'd have bakers who would travel with ovens. that They were brick ovens that they could disassemble and then reassemble on site so that they could bake fresh bread. Wow. Um, wow. And yeah. you had... Uh, Lots of women and children following. Um, there were sometimes surgeons who followed. Uh, surgeons were very expensive, though, so, so so it sort of depended on how deep the pockets of the commander were. Mm-hmm. Um, and these people would uh, nurse soldiers. They did their laundry. They cooked. They sewed. They served as occasional and full-time prostitutes. Uh, prostitution was fairly tightly regulated, so actual full-time prostitutes there were relatively there were much fewer of those than one might imagine following an army because there were problems associated with yeah. with prostitutes um uh they women would transport weapons on on the battlefield um so when the, well I, I don't want to <laughs> go on too much about that yeah, yeah. but um they also served as foragers meaning that they uh, for, foraging is a polite term uh that, that people <laughs> used for pillaging they yeah. went and oh, and they yeah. would attack attack people on their farms and just take Oof. their chickens and their wow. cattle and their hogs and their anything they wanted. Um, and the women were part of this. They were, wow. um, they're fa- fascinating. You would not want them in your living room. Um, but uh, <laughs> anyway, and, and so they, uh, in the days before standing armies, it was really women who provided the service of logistics mm-hmm. for these armies. I was going to say, Danielle, that's what it sounds like you're saying is, is a lot of women, but also men were in these camp trains. And really, it sounds like they're responsible for provisioning the army in every way, providing medical care. So all those things that we think of as being built into other armies, when we think of the U.S. military and moving out west and all that, all of those things are really sort of this informal group of people who decide to follow these, I'm going to try to say the word, um, lands connect. Lands yeah. Con- yeah. Which is, that's amazing. I mean, it's a whole, like you said, a, a like a small moving city of people that they, the, the armies themselves maybe couldn't really survive well without. Oh, absolutely. They just, they, they wouldn't have had time to, um, go out and get the food. They, Commanders would buy food when they okay. could, um, and and they would, they would try to um, establish agreements with local towns. But but when you're traveling through enemy territory, it's in your interest to mm. lay waste to that territory. And so one of the ways they did was before they would burn everything, they would take uh, as much as they could. Mm. Um, so yes, yeah. Okay. 
So um, your research in this particular case focuses in on um, the female camp followers and what we know about them. And I'd love it if you tell us a little bit about the woman named in the title, Elsa von Finn, who is one of the few women of these army trains that we really know about as an individual. So maybe let's start with how she survived in the historical record, how that came to be and what it is we know about her. So she was just a, a very ordinary person. We would have no uh, record of her at all except for uh, her being the friend of another very ordinary person who happened to leave a sketchbook with, with annotations, with, with notes. Um, and his name was Paul von Dolnstein, and he was a Landsknecht and a military engineer. And in the civilian world, he was a master builder. And we don't know much about him, but he recorded his experiences in this sketchbook. He sketched battles and military exercises, and he also uh, sketched pictures of his friends and his comrades. And Elsa von Vin is one of the 19 people he memorialized, and she's the only woman he names. And uh, from his sketch of her, we know that she was in a relationship with one of Dolnstein's other companions, and they are pictured together as a pair on the march, and we know that she was responsible for the money in that pair. She, the purse is on is on her body, and she's got her hand in the purse in this picture. <laughs> I like that illustration. So literally, <laughs> her hand on the purse yes. means she is good. That's great. I love that, yeah. <laughs> um, and... Uh, she was wearing a, a musician's hat or a jester's cap, which is really unusual for a woman. Normally, they're wearing these sort of flouncy hats with lots and lots of feathers, which is what all the Lanskinex are wearing. Um, and uh, the fact that she's not suggests that maybe she's a little elect e mm -hmm. eclectic um, mm -hmm. and interesting. Um, and we know that she's maybe a little haughty in the way that she her, her bearing is very um, erect. And um, she's got this sort of um, aloof or almost arrogant uh, uh, way of uh, looking. Um, and she also would have been practical because like other camp followers depicted in Renaissance illustrations, she's got her skirts hitched up. So no matter how lavish her attire was, and we know it was lavish, it was plundered <laughs> most definitely. And yeah. um, it's got the, the slashed sleeves of, of uh, the, the luxury clothes of the day that, that would have been forbidden to her in the civilian world. Um, by sumptuary laws, which regulated who could wear what, oh, yeah, yeah. keeping people in their place. But that yeah. didn't work so well in the Army, which was good for women who wanted to wear nice clothes. Yeah. So, <laughs> And she was hitching up her skirts so that she could move more easily, be more free in her in her body and herself. Exactly, yes. Yeah. It's very hard to walk um, miles and miles. I, wow. Literally, Can you imagine? Uh, wow. from, from Italy to Sweden. I mean, it, it's you walked. Oh, goodness. All that way, yeah. yeah. Wow. And so... Wow. And I... Oh, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Nancy. I just was thinking how much you've been able to glean from the sketch because the the artist himself included so many interesting details. Um, and I, I want to get back to that a little bit more. But Crystal, what were you thinking? What were you going to say? So I just love this idea of her being kind of eclectic and kind of having some flair and being maybe a little bit more independent. And, you know, you discuss how these camp women like Elsa were in some ways, they, they had more autonomy. They had a little bit more agency. Um, and in some cases, more protection than women who were indentured in like domestic service or um, working in agricultural labor on a farm, in a settlement. These women were on the move. They were kind of in this other structure. So in what ways were these camp women allowed to kind of bend the norms, especially the gender norms, and avoid the fact that a woman's honor was really tied to her sexuality, for example, tied to her virginity or her fidelity. So that's a huge question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so first, autonomy. Um, yeah. Women enjoyed a similar kind of moral freedom that men did uh, in, in armies because they were away from the watchful eyes of parents and town folk. And they also experienced independence and freedom to drink and carouse and behave however they wanted. Men were mm. hardly going to stop a woman from behaving, you know, however she wanted unless she were being disruptive. Um, and, and 
I think it's really key that she had the women had the opportunity to wear and flaunt extravagant clothing that they mm. there's no way well they first they couldn't have afforded it but even if they could have afforded it they wouldn't have been legally allowed to wear it and there also would have been this moralizing um getting above yourself sort of uppity um that they would have been scolded for um by 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 townsfolk yeah uh, with relation to honor yeah uh for women honor was Pretty much exclusively sexual. Um, so it was def it defined their chastity before marriage and their fidelity after marriage. And once this honor was in doubt, a woman was vulnerable to sexual predation from anyone. They were basically they were fair game because people would just say, "Well, she's common." Right. But, yeah. Right. Um, and this women at the at the margins of society. Um, whose honor was in doubt or just who didn't have a protector uh, were particularly vulnerable. And I, I think it's Im important to uh, um, imagine the lives of uh, women on it, who, who were doing agricultural labor, so they're on farms. Mm -hmm. um, they're not necessarily the daughters of the farmer. That Those women would have been protected by, by the farmer. Okay. But women from the town who, who did... Um, harvesting or planting um or women who worked in uh someone's house there's a lot of domestic mm -hmm. service yeah. uh they were completely vulnerable to the um advances of any men in the household uh, whether they were fellow laborers or whether they were certainly the the their master or their master's uh, sons or male relatives and the issue here is that uh once they got pregnant uh they were then kicked out mm -hmm. and and then they and their children are, are even more vulnerable um something to note uh galen um an ancient um uh medical um theorist or physician mm -hmm. um was was the found, founder of um a lot of medical ideas went back to galen mm -hmm. and so he taught that conception could only happen if the woman experienced pleasure so the idea of rape, mm. if you were pregnant, mm. it's just not, see. it wasn't possible. Right. You were definitely. Oh, my so, goodness. Oh, so then boy. the woman was, um, she, she was just so vulnerable. Anyway, oh. so um, this is, so without protection. Um, yeah. So and, and so these women had protection, more protection on these, in these mercenary trains. In a sense, they did. Because. Okay. Um, well, not in a sense. They just did because okay. the women didn't follow uh, armies en masse. Um, they would follow a particular soldier. And so these were called May marriages uh, because the campaign season was um, basically spring through through fall um, when, the, when the weather was amenable for, for travel and for fighting. And so if you could attach yourself to a man who was respected by his peers, then nobody was going to... Uh, mess with you and and so you were you were assuming that he <laughs> was yeah. himself not violent which is right, right. i mean there's a lot of alcohol involved here so i yeah. mean people and and people in general were more violent but um mm -hmm. and and a certain degree of violence uh in keeping women in line was not only expected but um uh re required is not necessarily the Condoned right condoned or required yeah yeah this idea yeah. that um you need to knock a woman around uh, mm. to keep her in line. That that was just part, so it was really inescapable. So um, maybe not but, protection in the way we think of protection. Exactly. But certainly relative yeah. to um, her life where she's just vulnerable kind of on all sides. Right. Um, mm -hmm. She would have been in, in many ways safer attached to a single man um, in an army train. Right. So we're getting a sense that it wasn't really a lovely time to be a woman. No. In this time <laughs> in place. You know, unless you're one of the small few born into the upper classes, but even then it sounded like you missed out on a lot of autonomy and protection at times too. Um, I'm just going to take a quick station break, Danielle, and then um, we'll get back to questions. You are listening to The Dirt on the Past with co-hosts Crystal Alegria and Nancy Mahoney on KGVM Bozeman or wherever you find your podcasts. We are speaking today with Dr. Danielle Mead Shelver about her research on the relative autonomy of women who followed army campaigns during the late medieval period. So 
Danielle, tell us a bit more now about the men and their experiences as members of these mercenary um, armies and what would tempt them to join up and fight on the behalf of someone like Maximilian or some lord or noble. And I know you talked about it in your paper a little bit, describe for our listeners a little bit more what the fighting was actually like as well, because it's it's hard for us to imagine sometimes where these just destitute men that are putting their lives in danger because they have no other choice or what advantages, you know, could they gain by participating? Well, uh, the the kinds of men who joined these armies really changed from the late 15th century uh, through about through through the mid uh through, through the 17th century, um, because at the period in the period we're talking about, the Lanskinex were very highly prized and they were very well paid, and so um, these th this was not a step down <laughs> for for and, and and you had to provide your own weapons, so it would not have been the poorest of the poor, but by the time of the 17th century, that really has changed. The um, the advent of gunpowder has. Um, uh, diminished a lot of the honor that, and we'll talk a bit, a bit about honor in just a second, uh, has diminished a lot of the honor of fighting. And um, they, they just have lost a lot of their uh, reputation and, and respect. And they are um, much less well paid. And so then it really is kind of um, the lower orders, um, uh, the people who are very desperate uh, who join the, the military. But in the period we're talking about, these are master craftsmen, or well, journeyman craftsmen, so to make ends meet. So as a journeyman, um, it took years to become master of your craft. And um, on on one, you have um, apprentices, journey, journeyman, and then masters. And along the way, in, in the journeyman period, it took uh, quite a while. And so to make ends meet, they would often um, join a, an army for, for a while. But um, as to the reasons that they would fight, and then I'll get to how they fought, there were basically three. They fought for pay, first and foremost. <laughs> They fought mm -hmm. for um, adventure. I, I think it's hard to um, overstate how um, boring, even by medieval standards, mm -hmm. uh, life was. Um, mm -hmm. If you were living, especially if you were living on a farm um, or in a small town uh, where very little happened. Um, and then the third reason was honor. So men had a variety of ways to earn honor, generally by mastering a set of skills that other men valued. So becoming a master craftsman or um, actually academics uh, mm. could develop honor by um, defeating other men in um, argumentation oh, yeah. by mastering mm. uh, those argument argumentation skills. Um, but by far the most widely accessible means of earning and losing honor was through physical violence against other men. And of course, the army is, that's, armies are where, <laughs> that's all they do. <laughs> and so, mm. um, as to the way they could, um, the way they fought, uh, this was really a transformational period in military history. So you, in the, um, uh, say, a hundred years before the Lanskinex, the, the knights were really the, the princes of the battlefield. And what happens with the Lanskinex and then the Swiss, the Swiss from whom they, they learn this Pike Square um, strategy is that um, you have these knights who are basically 2,000 pounds. Uh, you, you have a horse that weighs okay. 1,200 to 1,400 pounds. Modern destries, uh, not destries, um, modern versions of these same horses are closer to 2,000 pounds. Wow. But in this period... Wow. Um, That's a huge horse. <laughs> <laughs> in yeah. this period, they were 1,200 to 1,400 pounds, which still okay. was huge by the yeah. day. Then you had a knight, and then you had all of his armor, and then all the armor that the horse was wearing. Wow. And they yeah. are charging headlong... Uh, towards this square of men. And so a pike square, if if you can Google, if, if any of you out there want to yeah. Google what a pike square is, it's basically a Greek phalanx. So you have all these men yeah. and um, they're in a square and they have pikes that are 15 to 18 feet long. And as uh, the cavalry charges towards them, they stand stock still and they level their pikes towards the horses okay. and the horses can't stop yeah. there, there's there ranks and ranks and there's so much momentum and they just run Ooh. right into them Ooh. which is very gruesome yeah um and so this transforms um 
fighting in this period, and it becomes a, f uh, a foot soldier's game. Okay. Um, and and this is tremendous for honor. It's difficult to overstate. There there was little in, in this period that was more important to your identity than your honor, whether you had it or, or whether, whether you lost it. And so for common men to be able to attain the same kind of honor that knights had was just... Well, that's certainly yeah. worth fighting for. Um, right. So definitely Going draw. doing this. Yes. This adventure for honor yeah. and pay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Important to have the pay yes. in there or the the pillaging aspect of it probably as yeah. well. But da Danielle, do they use this Pike Square for um, a long period? Is it a couple centuries? How long is that? It, does it affect um, the success of having knighted horsemen, you know, um, with armor. How does that, how long does that period last? And do knights sort of then fall by the wayside? Um, it lasts until the Thirty Years' War, um, at, which is really when we see the widespread use of gunpowder. Um, so they're using, oh. uh, not gun, uh, handheld uh, firearms. We, we see a That's little true. bit, uh, even in, in, in the sketches here, we see a little bit of playing around with um, handheld firearms, but they really don't know how to, how to do it yet. It's not okay. until Gustavus Adolphus, um, the great Swedish uh, commander who really makes great use of, of firearms uh, <laughs> mounted. Uh, so so ca cavalry again, cavalry rises again, um, um, uh. but they're firing from the horses. And, and the, at this point, um, it's just not effective to have these deep, deep squares of you know, 20 rows of men. Instead, they 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 have very, very long ranks and okay. that are spread out wide, but there will only be maybe two or three ranks. And then you start to see what we see in, in the Civil War and um, before that where you have the front row kneels to fire and the back rows, you know, loading and... Um, uh, okay. So I... I or, yeah, I, sure. anyway. yeah, that's I, a little I, out I, of my I, period. Yeah, so sorry. I have the visual. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. From Dances with Wolves, I think, is where my visual comes from for that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to come back to Elsa a little bit and talk a little bit more about these sketches as well. And so a lot of your work in this paper, in this chapter that we read, really involves analyzing the sketches of these mercenaries and this one sketch in particular. But what is it that you can glean, kind of coming back to Elsa? What can you glean about Elsa and her status um, the, in this camp and in, in this camp train from images like this? Well, we can tell that she has successfully attached herself to a man who could protect her, okay. both by his physical presence and simply by his reputation because of who he is. He's carrying a halberd. And she's standing close to him in this sketch, right? Right, right yeah. next to him. And she's in front of him. And I in think this him. is important because that's not common in these sketches of um, the sketches of, of camp followers. Typically, the woman is with the man, like clinging to him adoringly oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, or behind him. Whereas Elsa is in front of him and, and Dolstein uh, depicts him as clearly his masculinity is not in any way diminished by Elsa being in front. They're, they're on the march. They're walking. Um, and he is a halberdier, meaning he has a halberd, which is this, there are these gorgeous works of art, which is mm -hmm. strange to talk about a, a weapon of destruction as yeah. beautiful, but they were, they were, they were um, bling. <laughs> Basically okay. they were uh, intricately carved and it was a status symbol. And to be a halberdier. What kind of, weapon was it it was sorry it was like yeah. a it had an axe uh, basically on 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 one side and then the other side had a, a, a hook with which you could pull uh pull people down okay and then there was a point on top it it, it was a multi-purpose weapon and yeah, halberdiers like were were um like senior enlisted men in say the modern day marine corps so okay you know first sergeant or something something like that so um and so she was standing next to him, and but she was in front of him. And and didn't you say something about there being um, a pair of pants on a? Can oh. you talk about that a little bit? <laughs> yes. So this is yeah, an, what is another this? sketch Stop with the, about the underpants. Yeah. I'm completely baffled. Yeah. Let's okay. Talk about it. So this is in another sketch where okay. uh, the woman is typically. Uh, this is not a Dolstein sketch. This is okay. Albrecht Dürer, who is much more famous. Um, 
And uh, on on this big flag, uh, the the Lens Connect is carrying, uh, there's this picture of underpants flying in the winds. And this was a very common motif. It was the idea of the battle for the pants that okay. people still talk okay. about today, who wears the pants in your family. And there were lots of depictions of women beating their husbands or whatever <laughs> man and grabbing the underpants or the underpants are on the floor and they're clearly scrapping over who gets to wear these pants. Okay. So masculinity was under threat or perceived to be under threat. But in the particular image that, that you're talking about, yeah. this is um, – it's in a, it's called the Triumph of Maximilian. It's all – it's, a, it's, it's all, if you want to see what a military, what an army train looks like, look up the Triumph of Maximilian. Okay, that's right, yeah. And it's this idea that at least in the army, masculinity was safe from feminine okay, attack. Okay. So this wasn't, I, I was mushing the, that together with Elsa, but that's separate from Elsa, but yet still a very interesting yes. um, <laughs> sketch. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you had mentioned earlier, too, that in one of these sketches, Elsa was wearing clothing that certainly looked like it would have been pillaged, something that was demonstrating higher status garments that would have been worn by someone of a higher status that she might not have been otherwise able to wear due to sumptuary laws. So um, I'm interested what you might know or what you would think about women like Elsa, were they able to actually then translate their status, whatever they were able to acquire on the army train, whether it's skills and or specific goods, could they, you know, cash that in for a change in class or status or honor once the campaign had ended or they were no longer part of it? So could you actually join one of these things benefit from it for a certain period of time and that could actually have a real world change once you decided to settle back into a village somewhere? For most women, probably not. Um, in mm -hmm. part because all women attached to an army train, unless they were wives, were their honor was just in question. It was just assumed that they were sleeping around, mm -hmm. basically. Um, mm -hmm. But there were ways that uh, they could that they could, as you said, translate this uh, change in lifestyle to, to the civilian world. And both of them were by marriage, which um, is exactly like in the civilian world. This is how you protected yourself. This is how you um, advanced yourself and, and, and your children. So some men did indeed earn enough pay as soldiers. So uh, the man she's with definitely would have been among the kind of the kind of men who earned enough in pay, they were paid double, most soldiers, where they could keep a wife. They could buy um, a house and uh, or a farm and keep a family who could stay there um, or who could travel with him. And that would be one way, by, by marriage. It's the only way to earn yourself any kind of lasting security. The other way um, was if she married a man who was who became a master craftsman. I think it's important to uh, try to picture for the, for uh, the audience to try to picture what medieval and, and early modern towns were like in terms of who mattered and master craftsmen and the crafts guilds to which they belonged. They really ran towns. They were the ones responsible. Well, they were the only ones who could um, carry weapons unless they were in town unless you were um, a nobleman. And that was because they were in charge of protecting the town. And so um, this is another way. And, and your, your house would be a nice house if you had a master craftsman for, for a spouse. So whether okay. he's a goldsmith or a baker or... A, there, there are differing levels of, of prosperity. Cobblers didn't make as much as obviously a goldsmith <laughs> made a right, lot. Right, so, yeah. Right. Oh, that's, that's kind of unfortunate that it didn't kind of carry over and that these women weren't able to move out. But they did have a little bit more autonomy. They had a little bit more agency while they were part of this train. And then maybe they were able to marry and settle after that. But but it is a little sad that they they didn't gain much, even though the men who were the mercenary mercenaries gained wealth and status and honor and pay and all those things. And the women had that for a time, but then kind of had to go back to the drawing board. I should say that if you're part of a, a, a May marriage, you split the pay. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. You split the plunder. Okay. The pay was his. He earned okay. that. But this is another reason why women were very good plunderers. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is where whatever they could get. Why Elsa the, the, had the nice dress. It's exactly right. <laughs> yes, with the class. Right, yes. right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. Yep. Well, this, it's been so, you know, we've ta- we talked before the podcast, too. So it's been so interesting to learn about kind of another avenue for women to have at this time, another avenue for them to be able to earn wealth to a certain degree, have a little bit more agency in their lives. And I like I, I say this probably once a day, I'm so glad I live now. Yes. <laughs> because yeah. it would be so oh. hard to live at this time, you know, and in our conversations, um, I just that is just reiterated in my mind again and again. <laughs> but I wanted to kind of move move us on a little bit, Daniel, and just ask you, so what are you working on next? So you gave this presentation at a conference in in San Diego. And so what are you working on now with this? So this is um, part of a book uh, on the German soldiering experience. And my co-editors, uh, I should say that I have learned over the years that writing a book with other people is much better than writing a book yourself. <laughs> For me, anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, so my co-editors are Casper van Dijk, who is the uh, director of the Dutch Royal Marines Museum in Amsterdam, and I'm sure there are Marines in, in our audience. It is Montana, mm. well, the heavy um, veteran population, and you might be interested to know that the Dutch were the first to have a Marine Corps. Mm. And my other co-editor uh, is Stefan Krause, who is the director of the Imperial Armory at the Art History Museum in Vienna. So the book centers on this sketchbook that I mentioned earlier, yeah. and it uses the sketches to try to help us understand more about the soldiering experience, the, the, the tools they use, so the weapons of war, the, um, the, the way they lived, the labor, the ways they constructed identity, which is in large part against enemies, the, the, the way they depict the people they defeated because generally they were in the business of... They, they were very successful. And so the way they depicted the people they... Uh, subjugated uh, is comical, honestly. Mm -hmm. And so they were saying we're better than them because we look like this and they look like that and we have this status and they have that status. So um, lots of interesting chapters on uh, sexualities, sexuality Mm -hmm. in armies um, and uh, food and weapons and the Swedish fight for independence against Denmark, which they lost over and over and over until Ooh. the early, uh, until I think it was 1523 or something like that. But okay. uh, this will probably wow. be my last book, though. I'm, I'm, <laughs> it just takes too much from family and yeah, and yeah. work. I'm so. sure it is a huge undertaking, yeah. but, but better with others than alone. <laughs> Definitely. Yes. And it sounds like a really lovely, diverse array of topics, though, all centered around, you know, this subject, which is always such a nice uh, volume to have. You really get a a fuller picture. Um, So, Danielle, we always like to bring our topic into the present as much as possible. So I'd like to just ask you um, what you feel like we can take away from these insights about the role of women during this time period, especially those following the mercenary camps, and and what it is that we should know or or better understand. You know, how does this either change our view or affect our perceptions? So I think there are several things that we can take away, but in the interest of time, I'll focus on two that come to mind. First is that women should be part of the historical narrative. Um, I like that one. Yeah, Yeah. That's a big one. And and really, this this was all news to to me. I don't know about you, Crystal, but to me, it made the whole subject much more fascinating to understand the full picture of what was going on. So, So I love that. But sorry, go ahead. Well, that's exactly right. The full picture, exactly as you said. Uh, Historians are getting much better at finding and using long overlooked documents, sources that uh, were overlooked because they were about women or about marginalized people. Mm -hmm. And so people thought they weren't important. And so, but historians are, are coming to the realization that an accurate history, a more accurate history is going to be a history that includes everyone who is there. And you think about 
Bozeman today. If mm. somebody were writing a history of, of Bozeman in, in the future, would you want that to be a history of a narrow group of people? Or would we want it to be people who include ranching and skiing and trail running and all the amazing food we have and, and, and just all the, the different uh, groups of people who make the culture here what it actually is. Yeah. So to be accurate, it it can't be narrow. So that's right. one of them. Go ahead. And more interesting when it's less yes. less narrow. You know, it's just much more fun to learn that history and to understand it, you know. Well, and to be able to see yourself yeah. in the past. This right. is one of the reasons I've never found great man history right. interesting. I just, it was irrelevant I've never, me. yeah, you know, you made military history fascinating to me. <laughs> I've never I've never delved into it because it was very, you know, m- male centric and there wasn't very many people like me, women in this in those stories. So so I have never looked into military history until we started talking, the three of us started talking about this and it's fascinating. It's so interesting. Elsa is amazing. Yeah, this whole, so this yeah. whole huge other economic component that involved women who didn't have means and this was an opportunity for them even if it was just a different way to get married or be attached to it provided another avenue you know for those things and women plundering you know um as part of what the army's doing it just the whole thing is fascinating to me thinking about kind of these moving cities that were moving around at that time so it really changes the way i feel like i would understand all of these these battles and campaigns and understand them more accurately. But as you said, also, I could now see myself in these histories. And I think that does make them inherently more interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, the second um, the second uh, thing we can take away is this idea of femininity. So Elsa von Vin challenges the, the notion of femininity that we grew up with. I, I, I'm assuming you yes, <laughs> grew up yes. with this same idea, yeah. which is really a very Victorian <laughs> idea of women in the past as being passive and um, helpless and just subject to the men in their lives. Yeah. And, yeah. To, and to a great extent, that, that is true. One of the ways to survive was being passive. But women did also have agency, and they did shape the world around them. And there's so much more research about... Uh, well, you're, you're reading Femina. I can't remember yes. who, who wrote this. Yeah. W- wonderful book. Yeah. Um, perfect example um, of how um, women in ancient and medieval Europe and, and also in Japan in the same time, mm-hmm. these women, women were ruling. They were producing art and literature. And what's important is it was valued at the time. It was work that was praised at the time. It's later that these sources are ignored. It was they were not ignored in the period. Right. So we see these ideals of about femininity changing. So uh, a quick quick thing about women, these camp following women and the way they were depicted by Renaissance artists, they're depicted as strong. Mm. They're carrying cradles, wooden cradles on their back. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and wow. Yeah. They're, they're strong, and yet they're so put together. I mean, their hair is done. Their outfits look great, and. So they're feminine, they're attractive, and they're strong. Okay. And and this, I think, is something that um, is now appealing. People now see muscle as and femininity as twin twin ideals. Right. But that certainly was not the way, you know, we not grew, in Victorian we, times. No. <laughs> and that was that and, was appreciated, right? Yeah. Right. And it's the same is true of masculinity, that these ideas yeah. are not fixed. So uh, in, in the 20th century, this is changing a lot now, but in the 20th century, you had these ideals of masculinity as where emotion is very contained mm. and very controlled. That is a product of the, the British Empire, um, and that's another story. Yeah. But in the period that we're talking about, masculine expressions of emotion are huge. Mm. Men would weep over joy and, and compassion and um Anger and so so masculine emotion was very explosive in this period and in in, in the ancient world, and so this mo- this modern ideal of a, a stiff upper lip, it's new. So that's another thing that we can take is that um, ideals about gender are fluid oh, and yeah. changing. Yeah, always changing. Well, thank you so much, Danielle. Um, we're running out of time, but we. 
You know, this has been such a really interesting discussion and little peek into this history that I I didn't know anything about. So this has been so much fun to learn more about this history and learn more about this time period and learn about the women and the gender roles at this time. So thank you so much for talking with us today. But where can people find out more about your research? Uh, well, thank you both for having me. This has been absolutely awesome. Um, and I, just if you just search my name, I'm, okay. I'm out there. And the, it's spelled really strangely. It's Norwegian. And it's not strange to Norwegians, of course. Right, um, right. So it's spelled <laughs> S-K-J-E-L-V-E-R. So Danielle Shelver. And our book on the soldiering experience uh, in, in the German Renaissance will be published by De Gruyter in, uh, the, in 2024. 2024. So, yeah. Okay. So everybody watch for it in 2024. <laughs> and, That's um, exciting. Yeah, yeah. It's super exciting. Thank you so much, Danielle. This has been super fun. I, I was so excited when you came in and told me what you were working on in, in the shop. And um, it's been so much fun to learn about it and discuss it with you. So um, thanks again. And thank you to all our listeners out there for joining us today. And as always, we ask that if you love this podcast, please tell a friend and make sure to subscribe so it shows up in your podcast feed each week. And please leave a review on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. So thanks, everyone, for listening today, and we hope you can join us again to find out more about the dirt the dirt on, on the, the past. And this is hard to do in Zoom, so yeah. that's as good as that, we can get it. Yeah, that was pretty good, Nancy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, such a big thank you to our editors, Drake Pinnell and Sierra Thomas. Thanks to Lawson Alegria for mixing the music and to Steve Durbin at KGBM and John Chadwell for help in getting the podcast out in the world. Yeah.